speaker tonight. Brian Gomes has been with ORP for, I guess, eight and a half years. Uh, I feel like he's in there forever. <laughs> Certainly all the years I've been working with him. Uh, Brian's got a lot of things he does, and we should be fortunate he came in from the outside tonight because he readily admits he'd rather be outside working with nature, kids, or whatever. He has uh, developed a specialty for ORP, teaching all the kids of all ages about the oyster, the health of the bay, and the importance that the oyster will lend to it as we restore it. Uh, Brian, the, the unofficial education director over there, and um, with that, I hope everybody's awake thinking about oysters. Come on, Brian. You're Stay up here for a second. Um, so when I started over eight years ago, and was also the MGO coordinator when I first came on at ORP, this was one of the first gentlemen I met on the outside. And the whole reason, he's saying it's ORP, the whole reason that the Seven River Association is the number one is because of the time, energy, and effort this man's put in. So let's give him another round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If you don't know the details or how to get involved or you want to get your neighbors involved, there's a few of these flyers up on the table and I've got some extras. All right. I'm putting my timer on 15 minutes. Okay. Uh, everyone stand up for a second. Like, we've been sitting too long. Stand up and stretch out your, stretch out your bad uh, leg, your bad back, or your bad attitude. But Whatever you have, bad leg, bad back, bad attitude, just stretch it out for a second because we've been sitting way too long. Yes, I work with kids a lot. Yes, you work with kids. <laughs> All right, good. All right. So, all right, clock started. My, uh, my beginning disclaimer is I am not a scientist, nor do I play one on TV. That's what uh, Dr. Muller is for when he gives his talk in a few weeks. So. Uh, my master's is not in science, I have no science degree, it's in education. So that is what uh, I'm doing. I'm going to do broad strokes education. Uh, I spoke to your organization, I guess, four or five years ago up at Woods, up in uh, Serena Park there. That was the last time I interacted with you. So a little more update. And I also want to focus on the importance of the partnership and bring light to what Oyster Recovery Partnership does. So we're going to talk early on history and decline of oysters, which a lot of you know, so I'll keep it short and sweet. Uh, and then we'll talk about the important work at ORP. And then I also have some uh, exciting props that were where Elvia was. Oh, they're over here now. Okay. All right. So, so we'll fast forward and say we know who Captain John Smith was. He came over. He uh, is considered the grandfather, godfather of the bay. Here's a cute little shallop that we pass around. We're, we're, going, we're keeping a kid mode tonight. All right. All right. Uh, so, so many oysters, they were a navigational hazard. We had oysters in the journal, the size, he has journals, he talked about the size of dinner plates. Um, I do not have one the size of a dinner plate, but like I said, you're gonna get some show and tell tonight. I do have one bigger than wow. those kids' hands. Man. That's a knife and fork one there. Um, so, we know they eat algae. Uh, they filter in everything, vibrating those little cilia hairs, pulling in all the water, all the sediment, digesting the algae, spitting out the sediment, making the water cleaner. Uh, and we've heard this next stat line that in Captain John Smith's time, they could filter all the oysters in a few days. Today, it takes over a year to do that same job for those 18 trillion gallons in the Chesapeake Bay. So we have 1% of the oysters, more or less, from back in the golden days of yesteryear. How did this happen, Brian? Great question, class. Um, three things that led to the massive decline of oysters in the bay. First is over-harvesting of the resource. They estimated in 1880 that we had 18 million, not oysters, but bushel baskets full of oysters that came out of the bay and fed most of the free world. Uh, we were down to about 25,000 in 2003. Today's wild harvest numbers are around 300 to 350,000. Never get back to those millions, but with the uh, awesome work at ORP, uh, science is working and it's really bumping those numbers up. Annually, it's between 800 million and 1 billion oysters that Oyster Recovery Partnership puts back into our local waterways. Um, this picture shows the massive amount of oysters that were coming out of the local waterways. So that's a shucking house. This is a two-story warehouse. And this is a man in the pile. This is another man standing in the pile to give you perspective. They thought it was an unending, unlimited natural resource. Um, 
So our four legal ways of harvesting oysters here in the lovely state of Maryland. We've got Captain Van Alstyne up here top left doing the hand tonging. We've got the patent tong, which the boat does the heavy lifting on the top right. Uh, I think that's Jay Fleming down on the bottom left there, scuba diving. And then the old dredge under sail on the bottom right. Um, so over harvesting was the number one with the decline of oysters in the bay. Second is disease and predation. Uh, this critter, um, when we do food webs in the school, sharks numbers are going down. Skates and rays right below them on the food web. They like to eat our friend the eastern oyster. So uh, we see these swimming around in the Severn a lot. Kids get freaked out and think it's a shark when they flip that wing up. But uh, if they can get their mouth all the way around an oyster, they have steel trap jaws. They can crush that shell and suck its body out. So. Uh, with the lower number of sharks, these guys are running wild in the streets of all our local waterways, and that's definitely influenced. So that's what they look like from the surface. These are controlled environments, these bottom two slides where they were practicing how big of an oyster they can take. The one on the bottom left is being a little greedier than he can fit in his mouth there. Uh, and then two diseases, Dermo and MSX, uh, contagious to the oyster, not to the humanoid. It does not make us sick, but um, you find those in higher salinities which is also an issue with the decline of oysters in our local waterways. Um, what's my next slide? Third and most current issue of decline of oysters in our watershed is we have 17 million lovely, beautiful, amazing people that live in our waterways. Uh, all the way up to Cooperstown, New York. Cooperstown, New York is? Yes. You guys know that way better than the kids. Uh, I, but I, I like when I talk to kids, they're like, uh, yeah, I played baseball there. I'm like, well, what's there? And he's like, I just went for a tournament when I was a kid. I was like, oh, no <laughs> clue. Um, so, uh, South Central New York, Central PA have a direct effect on the waters that we see on a daily basis here in Anne Arundel County. Um, and here's a sediment plume from our back-to-back -back store. Sorry, sorry. She's making faster than 15. I like it, I like it. I'm so excited about sediment plumes. <laughs> so, uh, when I show this to kids, I have to explain that's not orange juice trickling down the Susquehanna, but that is satellite shot from our space, and then uh, you can see it there on the Potomac. Look look how much cleaner the Delaware Bay is, top right there, versus our Chesapeake. Um, but yeah, this was back-to-back -back storms that we had in September uh, seven years ago, almost. Um, so what's next there? Okay, there's trash in the Conowingo. Uh, LV and I said we would not harp on all the straws and all the glasses tonight, but I will talk to the I will talk to the Salvis brothers that own the restaurant here because I've known them. They've been shell recycling partners for ORP since we started that program eight years ago. So they're going to get an airfall from me. Um, okay, so what Oyster Recovery Partnership does to help restore oysters to our watershed. So here's your oyster life cycle. It's external fertilization, egg and sperm meet in the water column. It looks like Mickey Mouse for a few days, and it looks like a clam for a few days, and then it grows an eye spot, which is not an eye at all, and a little foot, top right corner there. And this is a larval swimming stage for about two weeks. And then they want to hang out with their friends and family, knowing if there's already oysters there, that's a good place to set up their condo. So they slide down and attach preferably on the backs of their relatives and start building that reef upwards and outwards. Um, with all the sediment runoff that we have throughout the watershed, and other environmental groups talk about it's the nutrient runoff. Okay, so we have, whether it's the Big Ab Farm or the McMansion community down the street, not your community, but the community down the street. You know, <laughs> with that one lawn, right? You know the lawn I'm talking about. Really green? The really green one, okay. So the extra nitrogen and phosphorus runs into the water, creates those algal blooms, that algae dies, sucks the oxygen out so we know about the dead zones. The fish can swim out of the dead zone. The oyster? Not so much, but the silver lining, the oyster eats that excess nutrients, but it's more than they can handle. Um, so it's the sediment that messes with their life cycle and ability to uh, reproduce. So that last stage, as it's coming down and attaching to the backs of its relatives, the dirt, silt, and sediment that runs off the land that builds up on the reefs prohibits the little larvae from becoming a spat and attaching. So they slide off and die. So uh, that's like a 1% uh, success rate in the wild. Oyster Recovery Partnership gets that up to about a 30% success rate for that first year of life, uh, which is a huge jump up. Um, so, what happens? We collect shells from, and I like telling this story because it makes me feel like I've been around a while. Um, so when I started ORP, we had 22 restaurants in the Shell Recycling Alliance. 
in Annapolis and Baltimore. We're in one of the original 22 right here. Um, and we, I was working with a volunteer out of a pickup truck using five gallon buckets and a bushel box. Fast forward eight and a half years, we have two guys full time that do that, driving big steak body trucks, uh, picking up 150 bushels a day, four days a week from Virginia, DC, Maryland, and Delaware, and we have over 350-ish restaurants now, right Paul? Wow. So that's, that's a huge jump in that program. Yeah, that's great. Um, so that shell recycling program started just as like another um, offshoot to kind of um, get more shell, but now we have this great pulse on the community, and if you're an eco frico you can go onto our website, and all those restaurants are listed there, so you can go out and eat order at a restaurant that is participating and it's in the club. And uh, as you walk out, you can see the Shell Recycling Alliance logo on the uh, window as you leave help. So yeah. yeah. So um, let's see what our next slide is. Okay, so speaking of Shell Recycling Alliance, there's Wayne at the uh, Graysonville Depot, dumping a bunch of shells, so it gets... Uh, cured there and then works its way down to the hatchery in Cambridge, Maryland. Every half shell that we recycle gets about 10 baby oysters seeded to that shell and planted back into the bay. Um, so this is what oyster larvae look like. They are microscopic and I, I, I blew up this nickel in the shot and then like I now I get in fights with kids at school trying to tell me that's a quarter and I'm like no it's not a quarter. <laughs> Just because it's big it's definitely not a quarter. Uh, he's like it's a quarter. I can tell. I'm like no. All right, so the next one, if we can hit the thing, we can see a little uh, action. So this is under a microscope showing you the uh, progression of the first two weeks when they are larval. And they look like little clams, and they are fairly see-through. And then they grow a foot. So they're, uh, they're free swimming, and they have their little villia, and then they eventually grow feet after about a week or so, and stop swimming and start crawling. And in that last uh, two to three days is when they are looking for a permanent home to set up and become, when they go from the Bellager to the Peta Bellager stage there. And this is July, this time of year, July? When do they... So the hatchery is doing plantings between April and September. So there's a six month window. In the wild, I'm not passing these around, but 100 year old culling hammer and an antique tin. Yeah. Um, so yeah, they, they spawn for only a couple months in the summer when the water hits how many degrees? I need Fahrenheit, not Celsius. Oh, don't have Fahrenheit. I don't know. What, what's Celsius? <laughs> so yes, um, they so they have about a two-month window out in the bay and rivers. Uh, Horn Point Lab in Cambridge expands that to about a six month window for this mass production. So they are kept in uh, warm water in the spring and then cool water in the summer and then they go into the spawning table. So here comes Paul's favorite part. Uh, it'll never get old, Paul. All right, so to make this large scale spawn happen, we have the recycled shells on one side and then we have adult fertile uh, disease Disease tolerant. Disease tolerant. I got my word right. Not disease resistant, disease tolerant. Broodstock that are ready to do it. We keep them in cold water until it's time and then we put them on a spawning table. We raise the water temperature, play some very white music, and the spawn is on. <laughs> um, so they collect all the egg and sperm, they properly fertilize them, they go into these 10,000 gallon. Uh, raise your hand if you've been to the Horn Point Lab for a hatchery tour. Excellent. So those that haven't, go to the ORP website and sign up and say, I want to do that. Tours run throughout the summer and it's the scale of that science and technology is pretty mind blowing. Um, so they're larval in these 10,000 gallon tanks for about two weeks. There's a proper greenhouse area. You walk into that room, there are these five uh, gallon carboy things like homebrew. Um, and they're making all the five or six different uh, species of algae to feed them. So they're getting their fats and their proteins and all that the green, the red, the blue, the Skittles rainbow of uh, algae flavors. And then that's all happening in here. This is the greenhouse that's clear here, and this is where the uh, spawn is on happens. Uh, over here is ORP, so employed by University of Maryland, employed by Oyster Recovery Partnership, employed by Oyster Recovery Partnership. Um, 
This is a shell pile. We have about a dozen guys and a crew chief down there that are doing literally the hard hats, dirty boots, uh, heavy lifting labor that makes all this really possible. Uh, some of those guys have been there 15 years doing that work down there. Um, these are old fish ponds that are now unofficial algae ponds. Um, but that's about the size of a football field. So this gives you an idea of the amount of shell. And when it gets fully stocked from all the uh, shucking houses, this whole thing, it's probably two football fields worth of shell two feet tall. Millions of shells, and that gets used every year. Um, so the shells get clean, dry, and aged for a year, either a or there. They then get loaded in stainless steel cages that you see here. They drive them down and put them in these 52 setting tanks on the pier. This is the Robert Lee um, captain by Doug West out of Chestertown, who works up for us during the summer and does all those plantings. You'll see him just down the river in three weeks. Um, and next slide. Here's an up close of that setting pier. Uh, that's the chop tank over there in the background, the Route 50 bridge here, four miles to the bay that way. Um, so they add water. These are the stainless steel cages with the recycled shell. Uh, you take all the larvae right before they do the behavior change. They stop swimming and they crawl for two or three days. And when you see that behavior change on the microscope, you draw off a couple million that would fit in the palm of your hand. They go into the tank and they metamorphosize in a couple days and become spat, get loaded onto the Robert Lee. And here's some plants. This is a fun question with elementary school kids. What's that building? A lighthouse. <laughs> <laughs> it's the capital of DC. Oh, we're getting somewhere. Um, so, yeah. So the boat's been tricked out to allow it to do this large-scale planting. This big door slides up using a small fire hose, gently pushing it over. Using GPS coordinates, the Robert Lee will zigzag over that established reef. It needs to go on to either hard established bottom or preferably already oyster beds and then we're building that three-dimensional reef up and out to uh, have better water quality and I'm not going to pass around the shellac shells that show the life cycle but I boy, no. um, but I will put them on the table up here if you want to see a two-day old a two-week old a six-month old they're really cute when they're just getting weaned away from their parents um, so yeah, that's that's it. Yeah. Oh. Um, yeah. Let's see. Uh. Yeah. Yeah. One's fun. One's heavy. But I feel very compelled to show both. This one I showed all ages. The second one I show to middle school and up because. It's heavy, but with all these straws here tonight, hopefully it'll make an impact on you. So I'll, I'll narrate here. This is a scientist up at Woods Hole um, in Cape Cod, and he's about to pour all this algae into this five-gallon tank with a couple dozen oysters, and then you will see the time lapse across the bottom. Um, Paul and Kate have replicated this on the Severn River. You might have seen that on our Facebook or, or website as well, but. Um, this is the number one reason why oysters are rock stars, because of what they're doing here. And I love in the classroom when the kids are like, oh my, oh my, what, what, wow. oh my god. I'm like, yeah, wow. true story. Cool. So they're opening like an eighth of an inch, vibrating those cilia hairs, moving that algae around, digesting that algae, and then those puffs of them spitting that water back out that they don't digest. So, and. Um, Here's a good thing. People are like, uh, why should I eat oysters? Because they like live on the bottom and you know, like catfish and crabs, they eat detritus and you know, I'm not gonna get sick. Well, I'm not a scientist, again, start with that. They do not ingest or digest the crap your crap. It's like how I go. <laughs> they spit it up and it's literally called pseudo feces. They they make these little like, you know, loogie hawk balls that they spit back up into the reef and lower life forms will eat that. So when you worry about that, it's not like in the, uh, doesn't like that Vimeo. Oh, that's like, that's the, all right. So you got to go home. Who's heard of uh, the photographer, Chris Jordan and seen in any of his work or artwork. Um, I was listening to a, a Ted talk on the radio and they showed the video and it got really quiet. And I was like, what happened? Elvia, did you see this when I showed it down at the leadership thing? No. Um, 
So no one's seen this video? No. Nope. Okay. So we know about the trash gyres in all the oceans and the Pacific trash gyres the size of the state of Alaska. And I ask kids, is that a big state or a little state? They're like, it's almost as big as Texas is what they like to talk about. <laughs> So if you can't read it, it says Midway Island in the North Pacific Ocean, more than 2,000 miles from the nearest continent. And the birds you're gonna see here are all albatross and they go and migrate like all around the oceans of the world and they will go and breed here in April and May. Um, and a little biology on birds, so they're sitting on young and then they're going out into the ocean to collect what they think is food. Um, so and then birds regurgitate into the mouths of their young to feed them before they have fledged the nest. So that's what you're gonna see here before the U-turn. Remember, this is the middle of nowhere in the Pacific Ocean. And he found out about it and went and took a bunch of pictures because he had heard and wanted to see it firsthand. thing but this is once I saw this I have to share this with everyone and it's it's heavy but it makes you think and thank you for for uh, for all this mm -hmm. and I look forward to working with you on the board and I won't, I won't show any more depressing stuff <laughs> thank you <laughs> thanks Brian let's give him a round come on come on let's wake up let's wake up I know it got depressing there at the end thanks a lot um, any uh, final bids for our, um, anybody else want to take another crack at these wonderful river cruises? We have two cruises uh, coming up here. Anybody left? Anybody's got any more checks in their, in their wallet? While you're thinking it over, I just want to point out we had a really great year with the Green Give. I forgot to mention that earlier, but I think we raised, you all raised, uh, $10,900 on the Green Give this year, which was matched uh, with a $10,000 grant from a secret admirer of Oysters. And through the Green Give people, we raised, I think, a match of another five or seven thousand dollars. So all together, we did pretty well, which is an amazing feat for the this group. Thank you all. Give yourselves a pat on the back. You know. All right. All right one last thing. Two last things. Um, we have a beautiful river cruise, an ecology trip, with one of the area's preeminent authors and naturalists from the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, John Page Williams, and he's offered two people. You take two people along with him on his beautiful boat. What's it called? First Light? I've been on that boat. It's really great. And when you're going through shallow water, it really collects underwater grass really nicely in the propeller. And uh, John showed me how to take that stuff out of there. So, Karen Wright is our uh, winner for tonight with uh, John Page. So, did you, Karen, meet John Page. Thank you. And uh, Dan Mellon has offered another trip. Uh, this is going to be a bit of a history of the middle uh, section of our river. John Page is, uh, it's a secret. You know, you'll find out where you go when you get with John. Uh, but Dan is talking about the middle section of the river, and I think he really is favoring the, what I call the dark side of the river, right? 
right? Because I live on the sunny side, you know, that's where the sunset is, and you guys are on the dark side, I know. <laughs> Oyster boy joke, sorry. Anyway, Charlotte has won the, uh, the, the, the ride with uh, <laughs> Dan, and Dan says anywhere from four to six people can go along with you, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Bring a lot of red wine. With that, I think we adjourn, right, folks? Yes. All right, thanks a lot. Thank Appreciate it. Nice seeing you all.